And as some comrades say, it's lit, right? <laughs> lit, lit. comrades and welcome to today's Omali Taught Me Sunday study, the Institute of African International Study, live with the leader of the African nation, Chairman Omali Ishitela. Over the last several weeks, we have dedicated the Sunday study to addressing Russia's defensive war in Ukraine against the global colonial powers. Today, we are kicking off a new series titled Colonialism, the origin of capitalism, where Chairman Omali Ishitela deepens our understanding as colonial of colonialism as a mode of production. In this process, we will address the Russia situation as the question of the colonial mode of production is relevant to all the world's struggles. In fact, it is the starting point. Before we begin today's study, I ask that you take this moment right now to like and share this video and tag someone to participate in today's lesson. Let's broaden the reach of this discussion. We need you to make that happen. You know the impact of these studies on you as an individual. So take the time right now to change someone's life and tag them in the chat section. Share this study far and wide because we must struggle against the counterinsurgency, counterinsurgency censorship of African internationalism. So thank you for sharing. To start off our discussion, we'll have an overview from the Secretary General of the African Socialist International, Loezi Kinshasa, who will walk us through 600 years of European colonialism. So um, at this moment, I'd like to bring up Comrade Secretary General, Louise Kinshasa, Uhuru SG. Uhuru Director Akini, thank you so much for bringing me uh, to this series of us uh, on our colonialism as, a, as the mode, as the mode uh, of production. And uh, I would like to take the opportunity just to to acknowledge uh, Chairman Amarisela, the leader of uh, African uh, nation and the leader of African revolution, but most importantly, the f is also the finest leader of our time and the leader of a world revolution as is happening today. And um, <clears throat> it's really a privilege for me uh, to be uh, on this platform. And um, I just want to I say those uh, those things. So where do we start? I'll start with uh, a quote uh, from Chairman Omari. It's also a question. Would capitalism and the resultant European wealth and African improve impoverishment have occurred without the European attack on Africa, its division, African slavery and dispersal, colonialism and neocolonialism? And uh, this uh, a quote you can find it from the book, uh, An Easy Equilibrium uh, on page 63 by Chairman Amari Stella. Uh, next. Colonialism is a mode of production that got Europe out of feudalism. Uh, this is another quote uh, by Chairman Amari, and this also 
a, a response to the question just asked uh, earlier on the first slide. Africans have to be really aware, have to understand history, uh, as it really happened, uh, that the Portuguese engaged, not just the Portuguese, but they initiated that. They engaged in the 77 years of kidnapping and looting wars in Africa. Next. Africa was free, healthy and rich. We had power over our own lives. This really is the essence of it. We were free and healthy and rich and we had control over our lives. Next. We put this slide of uh, Massa Musa, who led a pilgrimage to Mecca in the 14th century, 1329. And uh, if we were poor, we couldn't go to Mecca. We couldn't mobilize thousands of horses, of uh, horsemen, uh, caravans of people, and taking massive gold with us to Mecca, to the point that the price of gold plummeted for more than a decade. Next. And uh, of course, the, uh, the gold, the news of the gold went around the world. Everybody knew gold was in Africa. And as often the chairman uh, has said, we lost a better way of life in a free Africa before colonial invasion. We fed, housed, clothed, and ruled ourselves. That's just something you cannot get around that. You cannot ignore that. That's what we did. Women were recognized as rulers in societies. No homelessness, no solitude or police murders, no police prisons, no famines, no constant civil warfare, no illegitimate economy, no illegitimate foreign rule, no colonial horizontal violence. We didn't know those things. I'm not saying we didn't have contradictions, but we were not going through lives as we're experiencing it today. It was a better life, much far better, better uh, life. We're... This is an example, the Manden Charter. The Manden Charter is basically one of the oldest, if not the oldest constitutions in the world. And uh, this was known in what we might call today uh, the Mandeng area, you know, uh, that would include Mali, Burkina Faso, part of Senegal, people who speak a language linked to uh, Mandeng. So we had a constitution that basically guarantees, uh, you know, basic human right to everybody. And uh, that's really fundamental. So we didn't wait uh, for the French Revolution in 1789 to know about the universal uh, 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 freedom uh, or universal rights. Uh, next. And uh, before the assault on Africa, before the attack on Africa, we had thousands and thousands of manuscripts in Africa, like in Timbuktu, which was an university with real books, with treaties on medicine, and mathematics, you name it. These thousand years before we hear of the name of Christopher uh, Columbus. And uh, underneath you have a uh, throwing knives. This is somewhere in the northeast of Congo, the Zandi people. They made all these knives. This is before the invasion of Africa. And these knives, you know, use metals, you know, different metals like uh, copper or tin and things like that. Just they are in the museums uh, in Belgium. And the other one you see is a gold. And this gold is from South Africa in, a, uh, in the area of, you know, between, basically includes Zimbabwe and South Africa. And uh, this is an 800 year old uh, hippopotamus uh, gold. Uh, it's just incredible. This 800 year old Africans were making already, you know, gold uh, using, you know, trying to imitate, you know, uh, nature, like uh, rhinoceros and, and things like that. Uh, next. So we, we had good lives. We, have, we had a better way of, of, of life. But in the same times in Europe, life was different. They had a system known as feudal system. 
you know, run by kings, lords, you know, uh, the aristocracy. So the king and the lords, the constitutes the aristocracy. And they have a state. And the existing state means that the society is split between the have and the have not. And they are the church who worked for uh, the have, for the, the king and the aristocracy, and the serf who constitute the vast majority of the people. So medieval serfs were in the lowest level of peasants. Medieval serfs worked on the land of, of the master, the nobleman. A medieval serf did not own any land of his own. Medieval serfs were basically slaves that had no right. If land was sold to another landlord, a Socrat, uh, the serf will be sold with the land. And you see the map uh, on the left. This is the map basically that shows you uh, we didn't have uh, what we call today nation state like France or Germany or Britain or Spain or they didn't exist and this really is important for Africans to know that what we call nation state today did not exist at all next these basically just a, another uh, picture you know how to see the feudal society uh, uh, was and uh, the rulers had to obey the orders of the Pope, who was accountable only to God. The Pope had a lot of power uh, in Europe, uh, in medieval uh, Europe, and uh, all this in the name uh, of God. You know, so that, God, that the Pope represented God, and the king, you know, was uh, uh, basically, in most instances, the, the Pope has a role to play to choose who will be uh, king in Europe at that time. Uh, next. And Europe was a place of diseases, like the plague. The plague was one of the biggest killers in the Middle Ages. It had a devastating effect on the population of Europe in the 14th and 15th centuries. Europe lost, depending on what statistics you read, between a third and a half of its population. And the meantime, you can see below uh, the writing on the left, you see the picture of, um, that's Mali. Uh, you can see uh, the Timbuktu mosque, the mosque in Timbuktu uh, somewhere uh, in the background. So life was, as I said before, uh, better uh, in Africa than you compare in Europe. And uh, on the right, you see where Europeans uh, live uh, in Europe. Uh, next. Uh, the plague. As a result of the plague, life expectancy in late 14th century Florence was just under 20 years, half of what it had been in the 1300s. Next. And uh, famine was a very real danger for medieval men and women. And uh, medieval torture devices like breast, the reaper, or they used, they used to call it also the spider. You can just imagine the level of uh, violence in Europe at the time. Next. Uh, violence, as I said, was like a permanent feature of society, whether as witnesses, victims, or perpetrators, people from the highest ranks of society to the lowest experienced violence as an omnipresent danger in daily life. So you have this uh, knee split on the right, and uh, the other picture on the left, you know, uh, the roller, if they're putting it in motion, this will pull you apart, pull your limbs apart, you, you know, just uh, such a level of, uh, of violence. It's incredible. Uh, next. Uh, childbirth during medieval period, giving birth was incredible, incredibly perilous. Infants in childhood, infants were particularly dangerous during the Middle Ages. Mortality was terribly high based on surviving written records alone. Scholars have estimated that 20 to 30 percent of children under seven died, but the actual figure is almost certainly higher. Uh, next, you hear uh, the European leaders all the time, all the time, they're talking about uh, the, the, they are defending the way of lives. You know, uh, you know, Russia is not like them and things like that. But the way of life in Europe, that's really what you've seen in those in, in these uh, slides. Heresy. It could also be dangerous to disagree. People held theological or religious opinions that were believed to go against the teachings of the Christian church were seen as heretics in medieval Christian Europe. So burning women was like uh, a game of the day, you know, uh, being accused of being witches, you get burned, you get killed. Uh, next. 
travel. You know, white people love to travel. Uh, you know, just see when you look at tourism in the world who is traveling. But people in the medieval period faced the host of potential dangers when traveling. A safe, clean place to sleep up on demand was difficult to find. Next. Crusades, looting expeditions disguised as holy wars. All this characterized Europe, a place uh, of poverty, and to solve that, they went to war uh, uh, in North Africa uh, and uh, in the Middle East. Uh, next. Christianity and Crusade wars gave people in Europe a sense of sameness. This really, you begin to see, uh, you know, the, the consolidation of a European identity. Uh, Muslim, Arabs, and more scholars transferred science and technology to Spain that they occupied between 711 and 1492. The use of gunpowder and cannons learned from China by Europeans changed world history. So you can see the connection between crusades and uh, also the presence of Muslim and Moors uh, in, in Europe uh, basically brought what we call science or reintroduced what we call science and technology in Europe. Uh, next. Uh, you have rescued yourself from feudalism. Uh, this is the biggest question every African should be able to, uh, to understand and to answer. Uh, this is the answer brought to you by African internationalism, the theory developed by Chairman of uh, This is really, really, really key. And this date, we should always, always be aware of it. Europe attacked Africa. Uh, you can see Spain and Morocco, they're very close. And a place called Ceuta, if you look at a picture on the right, Ceuta. And uh, that's the first place the Portuguese captured in 1415 in order to rescue uh, Portugal, to rescue Europe from feudalism, which means from poverty, from disease, from ignorance, from wars, and uh, all those bad things. Uh, next. And uh, the attack on Africa gave Europe the means to attack the rest of the world. This is really important. I put some of those pictures. You see the Ottoman Empire in green. 1481 is not that big, but by 1586, it's really big. Uh, you can see where it is. And now on the, the, the picture on the left, that's the the, uh, the junk. They used to call it the Chinese uh, 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 boats uh, by the 15th, 6th, by the 15th uh, and 16th century. So basically the point is the Europeans could not go to Turkey, couldn't go to India because uh, the East there, they didn't have uh, the, the power to do that, to go through that. And uh, China had the ability to go around the world, but they did not uh, uh, do that. So the Europeans uh, went down around Africa and also, of course, later on attacked the Americas. Uh, this is something also, you know, it's just to help us uh, understand basically uh, the significance of an assault on Africa. They could not accumulate capital just like that by attacking other places. They start on Africa. Uh, next. And uh, here uh, I'm, uh, I'm taking uh, uh, from uh, um, uh, the book written by uh, French Howard. Uh, it was a long Africa's worsened coast that Europeans preferred the techniques of map making and navigation, where ship designs were tested and improved, and where sailors learned to understand the winds of the Atlantic Ocean. These experiences, mainly dating to the 1400s, were to prove instrumental not only in the settling of the Americas and the opening up of new trade routes to Europe. So, basically, what they're trying to say here uh, was. Uh, French uh, Howard uh, trying to say here basically the attack on Africa was really fundamental. That's where uh, they learned new techniques. That's what they learned uh, how to navigate, how to improve, uh, you know, all these techniques before the attack on America, before the attack on the rest of the world. And this lasted for 77 years. And uh, that's this is something the Africans have to be really fully aware in order to understand the significance uh, of Africa in this global colonial uh, mode of production. Uh, next. 
the problem is not just that the people and culture of Africa have been ignored and left to one side, rather that they have been so miscast that the story of the global past has become part of a profound mistelling. Uh, that's really just profound. And he goes on to say the impetus for what turned into the creation of multiple European empires stretching across continent did not come from the yearning for ties with Asia, but from a centuries old desire to forge trading ties with legendarily rich black societies in Africa that were home to huge quantities of gold and an inexhaustible source of labor. So these are the 77 years we're talking about between 1415 and 1492, what the Portuguese and the Europeans did in Africa. Loot, steal, kill, kidnap, and all these contributed to, you know, to the accumulation of capital basically that transformed our Europe. Uh, next. Of course, we have the 1492. Columbus began the theft of indigenous land, the conquest of the Americas, marked the intensification of transformation of European feudalism into global colonialism as a mode of production. So this is not the starting point, but an intensification. And that's really uh, uh, important uh, for us to understand. Uh, next. That's, you know, a question we've been asking from the very beginning. And this is a question Africans should understand and be able to explain and also understand our own significance, how we're going to change the world. How colonial capitalism system replaced feudalism system in an impoverished Europe. Because we have to be clear, really, really clear. That's one thing uh, the chairman has been uh, insisting upon for, for, for some times, uh, that the development of Europe was not due to an internal phenomenon. It's not internal phenomenon. That's what basically uh, we're trying to say here. It was colonialism, which is not an internal phenomenon. It's not. So you have these pictures here. You have the white workers in the Industrial Revolution on the right. Underneath, you have Africans in the colonial slave plantation. And on the left, you have the uh, European attacking the Indians, the indigenous uh, in the Americas. But for all this to happen, the attack on Africa has to happen. You know, for the attack in the Americas to happen, uh, for Africans to be in the colonial plantation in the Americas, for white workers to be in the industrial revolution, the attack on Africa has to happen the first. Next. Europe, Europe was born out of colonialism as the exploiting, oppressing, negating pole that tried always to destroy and simulate its opposite pole, the rest of the world. That's uh, from Ozi Jaffa, quoted in Chairman's uh, a book, uh, Vanguard. And so here, we carry on from uh, uh, Ozi Jaffa. Finally, with the European arose the myth of European superiority and separate existence as a special species or race. There arose indeed the myth of race in general, unknown to mankind of before. Even the word did not exist before the lingua franca of the Crusades, the particular myth that they, 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 that they a creature called European, which implied from the beginning a white man. And uh, this profound so basically, there was no white man before, until the attack on Africa. And this gives you the significance of the liberation of Africa, which it will mean to the rest of the world. Next. Before the slave trade in Africa, there was neither a Europe nor a European. Nobody referred to that part of the world as Europe or European. It was out of this process that the very idea of a European man arose in a day that did not exist, even in etymology before the 17th century. Before the slave trade in Africa, there was neither Europe nor Europeans. So that's a, a continuity of a quote from uh, 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 Jaffa. 
colonialism, especially in Africa, created a concept and ideology of race. Before capitalist colonialism, there were no races. But now, suddenly and increasingly, there were races. Once born, the myth grew into a reality. You know, that's just, it is, is really, it's just, you know, uh, uh, profound to understand the significance of colonialism as a, a global mode of production that gave birth to the myth of race. Uh, next. Of course, 1884-1885 Berlin Conference is a phase of industrial colonialism, like the Civil War in the United States. This just to remind ourselves that colonialism did not, did not begin in 1884-1885 at Berlin Conference. It did not. Colonialism started in 1415. So everything that happens to Africans between 1415 until 1884 in Africa and in the Americas in particular is colonialism, pure colonialism. Africans have to be clear on that. So history of colonialism didn't begin in the Berlin Conference. You know, even the situation of South Africa just attests to that because the settlers didn't come there in 1885. That's really significant. Uh, next. The ships of the Portuguese gave the search for gold the highest priority which they found in West and Central Africa. And you go remember this. These, uh, we're talking of the 77 years before they reached the Americas. The Portuguese were clear. It's documented. Clear. We go in Africa to steal gold. They were clear on that. So Africa should know that. It's no exploration on things like that. Uh, next. African gold was also the main source of the mintage of Dutch gold coin in the 17th century, helping Amsterdam to become the financial capital of Europe. So not only they stole African people and forced us to produce against our will in the Americas, but they stole lots and lots of gold. So when we, when we call for reparation, Africans, you understand this, not just for the stolen labor, stolen lives, but stolen wealth also that took for centuries in Africa, well before Berlin Conference. So British Guinea gold coins in 1663 under Charles II, that's the king of England at the time. You know, even by calling it Guinea gold, gold coins, Guinea by the time is black, you know, uh, it just, it's un unbelievable. Uh, next, please. The African contribution to European capitalist growth extended over such vital sectors as shipping, insurance, the formation of companies, capitalist agriculture, technology, and the manufacture of machinery. At least 25 banks of England governors and directors from 18th and 19th centuries were or had been owners of slaves and were linked the slave training. So you could not talk about economy in Europe, economy in England, in France without talking of colonial, uh, of colonialism. Just impossible. Everything dependent on it. Everything. Uh, next. The most spectacular feature in Europe which was connected uh, with African trade uh, was the rise of seaport towns, notably, you know, Bristol, Liverpool, Nantes, Bordeaux, Seville, we can name others. Those cities came to life, became significant because of colonialism as a mode of production, which means because of an attack on Africa and theft of African resource and labor and so on. Uh, next. Most, now, uh, most were then works to death, we're talking of a, uh, uh, African uh, people here, the lifespan of trafficked people reckoned to be seven years or less. It was cheaper, wrote one English planter on Antigua in 1751 to work slaves to the utmost and by the little fare and uh, hard usage to wear them out before they become useless and unable to do service and then to buy new ones to fill up the places. Black lives literally did no matter other than to make their owners rich. 
So this is the significance of every single success, wealth development, whatever they call it, uh, democracy, uh, or everything enjoyed by the white nation, everything, the price, we pay the price for it. We are at the foundation for every, as the chairman put it, every single dream, every single you know career, professional career, you name it, it directly dependent and it depends on colonialism as a mode of production. It does not depend on feudalism or anything that the white people did to begin with. Uh, next. Underwriting slavery, insurance, slavery in the Dutch Republic, just an explosion of insurance companies in Holland, England and so on. Global general insurer like Aviva has also issued an apology for its connection because there is no business in Europe, no business under capitalism that doesn't have its origin in attack on Africa. That's what basically what we're trying to say. So this Aviva is one of the biggest insurance company today in Europe. We can trace Aviva's history back over 300 years to 1696. Given our long heritage, there has been decisions, actions, and behaviors made by our predecessors that are clearly unacceptable to us today. And it's likely that Aviva insured people or property that enables the slave trade. We is a sentiment saying to GTR, yeah, we demand reparation. We don't need the apology. Uh, uh, next, please. This is colonialism. Cotton became a British greatest export. How can Britain become, a, how can Britain become, you know, a, uh, a greater, a great, a great exporter? uh of cotton how can that be cotton doesn't grow here that's colonialism that's the africans are producing it so there is a direct connection as you can see between africans uh being worked to death and uh, white people having job in an uh, industrialized europe the two are part of the same process next sugar a new colonial product changed the diet of U European colonizers. Can you just imagine if you take sugar out of the supermarket in the United States or Canada or Europe or France or Australia, if you remove just sugar, can you see how the diet will be just transformed negatively for them? But that's colonialism in action. That's the Africans dying in a colonial plantation in the Americas, in the Caribbean, in Louisiana, all those places. In, in Brazil. Uh, of course, the British love the cup of tea. It's a colonial cup of tea. Uh, next, please. Haiti, the Pearl of the Antilles, funded the French Revolution and bourgeoisie rise to power. You cannot talk about what they call in Europe democratic revolution that brought the bourgeoisie to power because the bourgeoisie and their white working classes. So the bourgeois class, the white working class, both classes are a direct, direct result of colonization of African people and the other colonized people around the world. Direct result of that. Haiti fed France, fed French revolutionary, fed the French revolution, fed the French democracy, and there is no doubt uh, about that. Uh, next. What is the cost of mobile phones and laptops? It's the same process we're looking at. Colonial labor and genocide in Africa. Doesn't matter what, what type of phone it is, what type of laptop it is, whatever it is, the starting point is colonialism as the mode of production, which means colonial labor, colonial death for Africans, colonial poverty for Africans, colonial dispersal for Africans, you know, colonial powerlessness, all this stuff we, we suffer every single day is for the success of the colonizers. That's what African internationalism teaches us. That's what Chairman of Mali teaches us. That the starting point it has to be colonial mode of production, and uh, that is really. Uh, I, I think this should be at the last slide. See if there's another one, but I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so. So I just want to say uh, thank you to everyone who listened. Uh, thank you, to Chairman O'Malley, for definitely uh, equipping us with this incredible, invincible tool to analyze the world so we can change it. And I will ask everybody who is watching today, you know, to join, 
before even we go further uh, to the discussion, but the second thing I want to ask everybody, I'm going to share 50 times minimum when I, I stop talking. I'm going to share 50 times. So I want people to challenge me or to beat me to do more than I do so we can have thousand sharing today for this program to bring African internationalism everywhere to get Africans to join the revolution so we can overturn the verdict of imperialism. Oh, Director Kira. Her Secretary General Mwesi Kinshasa, well, I want to join you in, you know, calling on people to share and tag people into this discussion, like this video, spread this widely, um, because you can't get this analysis anywhere else. Um, and I really want to appreciate you for this visual historical walkthrough. Um, the theory of African internationalism developed by Chairman Amalia Shetela has allowed us to understand this question that the other important philosophers just could not grasp. And once you understand the world through this lens, it's impossible to deny. Colonialism gave rise to capitalism and it has been the colonial subjugation of African people, both historically and presently, that has maintained this global parasitic economic system. So thank you so much, uh, Secretary General Lawazi Kinshasa. And we're gonna keep this discussion going. Um, and so to speak more about this, I would like to introduce the theoretician whose revolutionary leadership has brought this conclusion to the world, the leader of the African nation and worldwide African revolution, our chairman, Omalia Shetela. Uhuru chairman. <clears throat> uh, Uhuru, thank, thank you very much, comrade. Uh, I'm trying to start my video without any success. There we are. <laughs> I want to really express appreciation to Commerce Secretary General Louise Kinshasa. It's a fabulous job that he's done, uh, pulling together a lot of this information. But as he was reading it and talking about it, you can see he made references to uh, authors who had already written a lot about what, we, what it is we are saying, that uh, the story, uh, though dispersed in various different kinds of locations about how Europe has raped Africa, rape, uh, how Europe became Europe, uh, raping Africa, raping uh, much of the world, uh, its uh, uh, expropriation of uh, all kinds of uh, value here uh, in, in what they characterize as the Americas or the new world. This, this, this has been there, uh, but we haven't quite understood how uh, to explain it or how to sum it up. And uh, so what, what has happened is that we have been uh, taught things by the most progressive of the colonizers of the world uh, that uh, what happened to us was a form of primitive accumulation. Karl Marx referred to primitive accumulation as an explanation of how uh, capitalism came into, into being. Uh, because otherwise it was, uh, it was not something that was uh, easily understood. That is to say, without this primitive accumulation concept that Marx threw uh, into the mix. And that is because uh, Marxist philosophy uh, explains the existence of various modes of production that have, have occurred in human society, uh, out of which uh, through the maturation development of a particular mode of production, another mode of production, it, it comes into existence. And he used, uh, for example, the, the notion of what he called primitive communism or primitive communalism as it has been characterized to explain uh, a time uh, when there was no oppression, exploitation of people in society, everybody shared uh, together. This was called primitive communism or primitive accumulation. Uh, a primitive uh, uh, communalism. And then uh, through contradictions existing there, uh, which is a certain kind of development inside primitive communism, according to Marxist philosophy, uh, inside the primitive uh, communal uh, communist mode of production, where the contradictions, uh, the things that held the society together was this relationship primarily between human beings, mostly in nature. This was the uh, where humans were engaged in a struggle with nature to try to survive, try to live, and things like this, uh, to grow food, to build shelter. This was the defining uh, thing that happened. There were no ex oppressors. There were no explorers, according to, according to Marx here. And then uh, at some juncture in this process of developing uh, the means of production, 
there emerges uh, uh, what is characterized as a surplus. Uh, the, we see the emergence of, uh, of uh, people uh, being able now to live without having to follow the seasons everywhere, looking for food, uh, people uh, de de develop uh, agriculture, people begin to domesticate animals, what have you, and uh, this part of the process creates now more than what individuals need. So this idea of sharing everything that existed based on, according to the Marxist assumption, based on scarcity, because things were scarce, then everybody shared everything. But at the moment there becomes a surplus, according to this logic, then the question arises in society, who will control the surplus? And here we see the emergence from this this mode of production that is characterized as primitive communism or primitive uh, 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 communalism, there emerges uh, now uh, slavery. And when we talk about slavery now, we're talking about phenomenon that existed uh, uh, in Europe uh, right now. And, and this slavery uh, was another mode of production. And out of this mode of production uh, from slavery, uh, the contradictions therein, within this mode of production where the, where the primary uh, forces were the, the slave owners and those who were enslaved. Um, and, and now uh, from, from contradictions, there they emerges from this slave society, what is feudalism. Now, unlike slavery, where the slave owner appropriated everything that was produced by those who were enslaved, the slave owner, the, the now ruling class, which is the feudal ruler class that come in, uh, Secretary General Louise, Louise just talked to us about, showed us uh, this feudal rule, ruling class appropriates uh, 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 much of what is produced, but not everything. And uh, the, the person is not formally owned. The person, the land is owned and the person lives on the land. This is the peasant, this is the serf. And, and the, the land owner, the land lords, the nobility, they can sell the land, but the serfs go with, go with the land. And they were impoverished. There, was, there were circumstances under feudalism where people were literally naked. And this lasted for something like a, a thousand years almost in Europe, lived under these circumstances. And then from feudalism, there comes this, this capitalism. And this is something too, according to Marx, that emerges from this feudal mode of production. And the feudal mode of production is something that it was existing throughout what we now know as Europe. Europe didn't exist at this moment, just various fiefdoms, just various kingdoms, if you will, that were controlled by local lords and, and, and nobility, these forces uh, existed in what was now Europe and what is now Europe. And, but then how do, how do we get then from, from this situation of feudalism, uh, this relationship between uh, the, the landlords and the, and the peasantry and serfs uh, were the primary uh, forces and how do we develop from there into this global situation, this global economy that now uh, 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 captures the entire world, envelops the entire world? And this was a mysterious thing that Karl Marx uh, explained away with this concept of primitive accumulation of capital. And in, in this, he talks about the development uh, from, uh, from feudalism to capitalism. And he talks about it in a way, however, that captures the history of African and other peoples around the world uh, and takes it from us and make us, it makes us a part of the history of Europe. So the struggle from feudalism to capitalism is a struggle uh, as a history of Europe. Uh, so that we become, as Karl Marx referred to, uh, this primitive accumulation of capital that developed capitalism, which was the development of Europe because Europe was the only uh, place, uh, this, this emerged Europe, this, as Comrade Luesi was talking to us, and he was quoting from Hosea uh, Jaffe, and his uh, work on a history of Africa shows that before slavery, before colonialism, there was no Europe. Europe was a creature of this process of, of, of these, these, these territories, these, these kingdoms, this, uh, 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 capturing uh, and enslaving and colonizing uh, peoples uh, throughout the world. This is the thing that gave a common identity. 
uh, to this, this what was up to now, this disparate group of people who define themselves primarily in relationship to each other. That is to say, the Celts uh, then, and, the, and, the, and the Normans and the, these various other kinds of European of, of these forces that existed in this territory, but did not see themselves as a single. Uh, and the, an exception to this may be, or part of this process was what was called the Crusades, that we saw the attack on northern parts of Africa and what is called the, the Middle East, uh, the Crusades, this uh, under the leadership of uh, uh, the direction, the inspiration of the Pope, uh, then we see this emergence of, the, of all of these entities attacking these areas in this holy war, as it was characterized, looting and what have you. And this began a process of acquiring an identity of what was going to be characterized as Europe as Christendom. This area was known as Christendom at, at Christendom as one time. And this is the thing that helped to shape the consciousness and shape the, the, the philosophy, if you will, even of what is now characterized as the West. Christendom was something that, that, that initiated uh, this process that, that we are talking about now. And this identity, this group identity, this sense of sameness. Uh, so the sense of sameness, it begins to be shaped with the Crusades uh, that, was, uh, that were initiated against the parts of Northern Africa, parts of what we now refer to as the Middle East. This is old contradiction that we're talking about. And so uh, there was no Europe. Uh, and what gave uh, uh, rise to a Europe was this process of colonial slavery. And the, the, this is the thing that united the, 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 these, these separate and disparate uh, groups uh, into one and, and, and set them out uh, uh, in a process of, of capturing human beings and human resources on uh, looting expeditions around the world. And this is something that became extremely significant, extremely important, and extremely necessary uh, subsequent to, uh, with the subsequent uh, to the uh, the, the, the great black plague the, that the killed uh, half of Europe and the, it, it destroyed or nearly destroyed the economy. So there were, there were desperate straits. This area that we now know as Europe were in desperate straits. And so this was also an inspiration. Uh, and then we talk about Mansa Musa, who made this 3,000, 3,500 uh, mile uh, trip uh, from Mali uh, to, uh, to Cairo. Uh, in this great crusade with 65,000 people as an entourage spreading gold all over the place. Later, uh, it is this memory of this gold uh, that comes from Africa that, that, that creates an impetus for all Europeans, these people who would become Europeans uh, to search for this gold in Portugal as we just saw in the discussion that was uh, initiated, the overview by Comrade Secretary General Luizzi, Portugal uh, was one of the initiators in Portugal, which up to this time was just a tiny, relatively insignificant uh, entity, appendage, if you will, almost to Europe, uh, becomes an extraordinary power because of the gold, because of it begins to this on the coast of Africa, it begins this looting process, it begins a process that, and, and that even uh, co contributed to the development, the emergence of sugar uh, as uh, this factor that changed the diet in Europe uh, and, 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 and also brought tremendous amounts of resources. So Portugal uh, starts this attack on Africa, and this is something that, that starts again 600 years ago. And so uh, this, this is the process, by the way, that sets all these Europeans out on this looting expedition of Africa that consolidates uh, Europeans into a single entity that, that we know as Europe uh, and gave rise to and, and consolidated this whole world economy now. A world economy uh, is revolving around slavery, revolving, uh, revolving around colonizing and looting the rest of the world. This is what we refer to as a colonial mode of production. So there was feudalism, a mode of production that, that defined reality in life in Europe uh, 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 up, uh, up until this era. And where you see in the 15th century, you see the beginning, the real serious drive uh, to consolidate this world economy uh, through uh, colonial slavery, looting Africa, 
uh, looting uh, the Americas and the rest of the world, dominating this. This is the drive that, that we are experiencing right now, this ongoing process of theft of resources. This is a colonial mode of production. It's a new mode of production. So we move from feudalism uh, to uh, uh, as a mode of production in Europe uh, to a global mode of production, which changes the world. And we create a foundation that upon which all political and economic activity that occurs in the world now is connected to this driving process. That's why we've been able to say that when you look at uh, how this social system that affects us so much uh, came into existence, when you look at uh, uh, what they characterize now as the West, we made this distinction between uh, Russia uh, that, that we are looking at right now and most of the so-called West because the, the, most of the West is defined in part because of its relationship to this colonial looting process that gave rise to this social system, that gave rise to the experiences that Europeans had that led to the, this, this uh, revolutionary project uh, to overturn uh, the, the, the foundation, the who is going to, uh, not the foundation, but certainly to overturn uh, the this 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 system that was being that was as it was being experienced by Europeans uh, in Europe, and so here you have the emergence from this process of a ruling class of the of the of the bourgeoisie uh, who is the chief expropriator of value that's coming from colonialism, and then you have the emergence of the white working class, and so that uh, that this contest that exists between these white workers and work, white rulers uh, becomes uh, uh, something that defines how we understand the development of the world. And, and this is because what we now have, what has happened is the struggle against capitalism obscures the foundation of the entire system, which is colonialism. The colonial mode of production is what gave rise to what we now refer to as capitalism, where the centrality of the experience of capitalism happened on the pedestal of colonial domination of Africa's and oppressed peoples around the world. That's what we're talking about. So when, when uh, we look at uh, now, uh, and we use this example coming into discussion for the last uh, two or three weeks, we've been talking about the defensive war being fought uh, by uh, Russia against Ukraine. Uh, it, it, it is an extraordinary kind of experience because what we are seeing here is an ongoing process of assault. The, the whole colonial mode of production is something that's, that has, was initially challenged and, and, and has been challenged for the longest period of time by the colonized ourselves. And uh, the greatest uh, probably threat to the colonial mode of production since the, since the Haitian Revolution, uh, uh, which challenged the entire setup uh, with this success in 1804, started in 1700 and something. So, but the, the, the probably the most explosive and significant assault on the colonial mode of production uh, was the movement by Marcus Garvey, the Universal Negro Improvement Association. And this is because what Garvey did was to mobilize the, those uh, who were critical uh, to the colonial mode of production as Africa. In Africa, and those Africans who have been uh, uh, dispersed all around the world, throughout the Americas, uh, African people who were a part of that process, and then even Black people in other places of the world who, who experience oppression, exploitation, because the colonial mode of production also comes with a superstructure. That is a philosophy, that is ideas, that is the culture. That <clears throat> <clears throat> and, and legal systems and things like that, it reinforces this, this economic base of exploitation that comes from colonial slavery. And so uh, this, these ideas have defined black people, but people, dark people, it gave rise to the white man. Uh, the colonial mode of production gave rise to the white man. The white man uh, comes into existence and then the white man creates the black man in terms of philosophy, ideology, creates himself, creates the black man. And so uh, everybody who is what, not what they have now defined as white uh, uh, is subject to uh, ideological, philo philosophical and political justification for oppression, exploitation and taking 
the resources of the people. So you have people, Africans in Australia and Africans in various other parts of the, of, of the world uh, who uh, experience oppression that's justified, political institutions created uh, to justify. I mean, Hawaii gets, gets stolen by the Americans, the indigenous people, all this is justified and institutionalized in terms of legalities, laws and customs and things like that. Uh, through the superstructure born of a, of a, of a, from through this colonial mode of production, a superstructure born through uh, an economic uh, foundation of expropriating value from those of us who are colonized. It's a parasitic social system. It was parasitic at its birth, and that's the kind of thing that Kermit, uh, Secretary General Luizzi was just talking to us about. And I hope I haven't complicated the question too much, but I do want to go back uh, to this question of the white man. <laughs> Uh, because the white man is uh, something uh, originated with colonialism. The white man is an uh, invention of colonial slavery, the colonial mode of production, and 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 it was the game. The it was the the political, uh, the ideological justification of uh, the war being made against the rest of us. At one time, uh, someone. Uh, you remembers that we were taught that it was justifiable to do it because whether people were Christians or not Christians, but now what we have is the emergence of a colonial mode of production full fledged and, and, and the white man as, as, as he has defined himself, as the colonizer has defined himself as Lord and master of the world and the rest of us are, are subject to his whims. And, uh, and this is the, how the colonial mode of production uh, looks. The colonial mode of production is a mode of production uh, that is characterized by the parasitic expropriation of value uh, by, uh, by, by different countries and societies, uh, the theft of resources, the parasitic uh, theft of relationship existing between uh, this parasite and the host. The rest of us become host to this parasitism. This is the colonial mode of production. This is what helps shape and defines this colonial mode of production. And the colonial mode of production is not something that simply uh, impacts those of us who are quote unquote colonized and those who are not colonized. It, the entire world economy is now hooked into this process and the ideas and what have you of this economy hooked into this process, except Russia didn't go through this process. The, the Russia did not leave feudalism uh, to come into the capitalist system through slavery, through colonialism, just as England and France and the United States and all these other powers did. Russia came into modernity uh, through a revolution that was made in 1917. And the 1917 revolution in Russia happened at a high tide of anti-colonial resistance around the world. And this was at the time of the first imperialist world war. And as you know, uh, the first world war was a war to redivide the world. This was a war between, uh, among, between the colonizers to redivide the world, to, uh, who were not satisfied with what they had in terms of colonial, colonial looting and what have you. This was the, uh, the, the ending of this war resulted. This was something that followed 1884, 1885. Remember, this is where the white people got together, uh, the colonial powers got together in Berlin, Germany, and carved up Africa and shared it out among each other. This, this looting, this greed, this uh, process uh, 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 influenced by Mansa Musa, you know, back in the 1300s, uh, now is, is, it continues to inflame and influence uh, the opinion and direction of uh, European development, what is not gives birth to Europe and gives birth in the process to this looting expedition and a social system based on looting. Uh, and this looting process uh, is happens inside uh, among uh, the white people themselves, as Karl Marx once said that uh, what he referred to as wage slavery in Europe, wage slavery in Europe, uh, where white people get paid for work, but uh, they think that it's not enough because uh, so much of the value was being expropriated by the bourgeoisie, by the ruling class. He said, wage slavery in Europe required as a pedestal slavery pure, slavery pure and simple in the new world. And, and that was us. And, and the colonial process is that which, which uh, the whole capitalist uh, social system, capitalist thing uh, rested on. 
And so you have this process and then about 19, and so in, in uh, this war between, uh, you saw the struggle uh, happen again in, in, uh, that led to the Berlin Conference among uh, European powers to say, we don't have to fight over this Africa thing. We can share that with each other. Uh, uh, and then uh, uh, this war started uh, over who was gonna get what part of, of, of the world. Who was that in, in, in his first and fearless world war? 1914, this thing kicks off. 1914, something else is happening in Jamaica. In 1914, that's when Marcus Garvey created the Universal Negro Improvement Association. A few years later, a couple of years later, he moves to Harlem in New York and what have you. He begins to grow this extraordinary movement uh, all over the world in 19, uh, the time of the, of the first and fearless world war. Uh, uh, oppressed people, colonized people were engaged in struggle. And so the, the, the Russian revolution happened in the context of the struggles of the people of the world and the struggles of white power to redivide the world. The Russian revolution uh, happened within that context. And what gave it a special significance to Europeans in part was because it was a part of what was supposed to be Europe. And the, then the Bolsheviks, the Russian communists uh, are the ones who who, who in Russia um, were able to win the revolution in part because they guaranteed the people in Russia that they were not going to participate in this war to redivide the world, the first world war. They're gonna pull Russia out. So many Russians had died in this war. And so they pulled Russia out and they made this revolution. And the moment they made the revolution, the rest of white power, they made the revolution uh, 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 during this, this period of extraordinary struggle that was happening around the world about colonized peoples around the world. And then they were attacked uh, by, they were invaded by all of the colonial powers, including Japan and the United States invaded Russia. Uh, and, 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 and that you know, tells a bit of the story about when we, this whole thing began that we see uh, uh, happening in, with the so-called West attacking Russia today because it, it has its origin in that moment has the origin in the fact that we saw Garvey unleashing revolutionary struggle all around the African world and it was everywhere. At a time where uh, Nicaragua, uh, uh, the US government was dropping bombs uh, uh, in Nicaragua and, and in Tulsa, Oklahoma at the same time frame that the year apart, uh, or both uh, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, black people, uh, 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 Nic Nicaragua uh, being bombed by the United States government at the same time, the so-called Red Summer, uh, where, uh, where thousands of African people were being killed by white mobs uh, throughout the United States. This was the context of the Russian Revolution. Uh, and it was not just a, a, a group of uh, white people fighting among themselves. It was the context was the struggle against colonialism. That's the thing that thrust uh, the Russian Revolution to the surface and gave it so much significance. And that's the thing that started this war that was made of uh, being made against Russia and the ongoing process of attempting uh, to isolate, to uh, demonize, to destroy Russia as a force that was on the side of the colonized peoples of the world. That's where it comes from. And so uh, what we're looking at today, of course, is that uh, the U.S. has succeeded along with the other colonial, the only reactionary, uh, slimy, uh, slave-owning colonizers country. They have united uh, 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 at this moment uh, to uh, destroy Russia. They've been working at it for a long period of time. They got long memories, unlike so many Africans and so-called African leaders. They got long memories, and they recognize the significance of Russia, especially during this time when the US economy has been in trouble, when the whole colonial economy has been in trouble in part because of the resistance of colonized peoples around the world, uh, when the Biden administration uh, is, has been in the doldrums, is, is polling numbers uh, dropping through uh, the bottom, uh, when the whole uh, colonial uh, system, the whole alliance of, of white reactionary colonial powers uh, is being threatened in terms of uh, the hegemony of the United States, all of these things are going on. And then they, they go against uh, uh, Russia. They use Ukraine uh, to attack Russia. They've already killed 14,000 people uh, in uh, 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 Ukraine, Eastern Ukraine, who are uh, ethnic speaking, who are Russian ethnics, et cetera. So they, uh, they have set up the process of establishing nuclear weapons that will be five minutes away from 
Russia, this is the part of the process that America is making. It's a colonial mode of production that, that has existed and Russia has been part and parcel of that, independent of his will and perhaps even independent of his consciousness. But it was there when Paul Robeson was there uh, uh, trying to fight for black people here. It was there uh, when we were fighting in Angola and other places. They were there when Cuba was there. It was there uh, when uh, at least for whatever its own purposes to unite with struggles against colonial capitalism at any given moment. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that we're looking at. So I thought it was really important that Kermit Louis laid this foundation. And as I said, he used information that's been available, that's been there, but it hasn't been summed up appropriately. And that's because we have fall victim, fallen victim to this assumption that we were part of somebody else's history when the fact of the matter is that it's a colonial mode of production that we're looking at, not something that uh, that was put in motion that somehow we uh, were to be involved in making history for Europe uh, as some kind of primitive accumulation, rather, uh, we are colonized. And if you are part of somebody else's history, you're always trying to fix their, their situation. You're always fighting against racism. You're fighting against some kind of black left in their thing. But once you come to a conclusion that this problem is colonialism, you know, once you understand the colonial mode of production, then your objective is not to perfect it, but to destroy it. Uh, and that's what our responsibility is. And that's why this discussion is so important. That's why recognition of the existence of a colonial mode of production is extraordinarily important and, and, and pathfinding, uh, earth shattering, if you will. Uhuru, come at uh, Uhuru, yeah. Uhuru, her chairman, well, really want to just appreciate your intervention in the overview and just helping to contextualize the whole world. And as you said, to understand the whole question of colonialism as a mode of production gives you something to, to fight against. It places Africans as the subjects of history rather than you know the footnotes of somebody else's history. And it gives our struggle concrete trajectory. And I think once you know this, you can't unknow it. Like you, this is just fact. And um, you know, I, one of the, the questions that, you know, we were going to go into was the whole uh, Russia's defensive war in Ukraine against global colonial powers um, in the context of this colonial mode of production. And you've, you know, you've already brilliantly laid this out. And, um, you know, just to, again, help to explain what's happening in Russia, this has been an ongoing thing. And it's a part of, you know, having been locked into this whole you know, locked into this colonial capitalist system and how you talk about the world, not just a part of, of, of Europe or the US, but the whole world was locked into this parasitic relationship, this colonial economic system, like the whole world ha it was forced to participate in that and is struggling, you know, um, every single day as a, as a consequence. So I just, you know, you just said so much and, um, you know, I just really want to appreciate this. Well, Director, before moving uh, further, I, I just want to say that, um, especially when it relates to this Russia-Ukraine question, um, that we have seen uh, so-called Black leftists, I shouldn't say so-called, they are Black leftists, and uh, other uh, liberals who, um, uh, you know, can recognize, you know, like NATO has done some bad things and it's trying to, and circle and it goes gone too close to Russia uh, more than what it should have gone and uh, uh, and you know Ukraine are fascists in Ukraine and Nazis and things like that uh, and then they they say then they're opposed to all of that uh, but they want to make it clear and they say explicitly but well, this is we're not this is not a pro Russia uh, position and then we will see some others uh, who have said that. How can you unite uh, like with Putin and Russia? Uh, and they take it all out of the historical context and doesn't e don't even understand like how history moves and how uh, these contradictions that we are dealing with. But the, for the most part, I think it's really important because we have an extraordinary uh, mobilization that's been planned by the African National Women's Organization, a, a Black Mothers uh, uh, mobilization uh, uh, against them stealing our children. And there were all these all these liberals and, and Negroes and stuff who were supposed to be working with them, some of them backed out because of the party's position on Russia. And, and they, they can't do that. And of course, part of it is that they're losing, they lose their grants because of the, the extraordinary kind of uh, oppression that's been initiated throughout the United States 
that uh, that's not so obvious as it might be in some other place. They just take your money, they just take your shelter, they just take your ability to function, you know, from you. And that's one thing. And the other thing that's happened, of course, is that we are looking at forces who call themselves being able to hide, claiming to be revolutionaries when they're just a loyal opposition. They're loyal to the system. They're just a loyal opposition. They are not talking about overturning the social system. They are not like the African People's Socialist Party globally intent on taking power so that African people can have the power in our own hands and being free and, and defining uh, uh, and divining uh, uh, our future based on recognition of the centrality of the oppression and exploitation of African and other colonized people. We are the central force. And when you come to an understanding of, the, of, of this colonial mode of production, then you remove uh, uh, white power, you remove the colonizers, whether they call themselves, uh, whether they are communists or whether they are reactionaries, you remove them from, cent from the center and place ourselves in the center. And that tells us primarily what it is that we have to do as opposed to how we have to get them to do something for us uh, or in our benefit. And I'm not struggling now against any tactics or uh, anything like that, that might utilize uh, contradictions and, uh, between contending forces uh, uh, to our benefit. I'm talking about the to, the to what end that we are looking at right now. And the difference in understanding a colonial mode of production is what we're fighting against. Uh, and some, uh, some, some other uh, kind of uh, uh, iteration of uh, a European uh, process of development, uh, that's, that's profoundly significant, Uhuru. Her, her chairman, thank you so much for just that clarification. And, you know, this, I mean, we've approached this whole Russia uh, situation, um, you know, from this point of, from this perspective, from this position, um, you know, of African internationalism and, you know, and through historical materialism, able to assess the whole, his, you know, uh, 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 assess history as the, you know, the basis for what we are seeing today. And, um, you know, it's it's the correct position and the party. That's why that's why the party is the vanguard. Um, and, you know, it has to, to take the blows, you know, by taking the forward position, the position that's going to take us to victory. The party has always, you know, never been afraid to, to take the position, even though it's unpopular at the moment. But I mean, we see, though, you know, the whole this whole question is so out there in your face. It's undeniable. People are being confronted with it, are challenging it every single day. So, you know, it's only a matter of time before people understand the world um, uh, you know, based on what it is that you've put forward, you know, over the course of, um, you know, your fit over, over 50 years in the struggle. So, um, thank you so much, chairman and, and secretary general Nwazi. I don't know if you had anything, um, additional to add based on uh, what the chairman has, um, brought to this discussion. Um, if not, we'll, we'll go ahead and move it, but, uh, secretary general, did you have anything you wanted to add? <clears throat> Yes. Uh, yeah. Just one first. First of all, United, uh, as you, uh, as the chairman put it, uh, brilliantly, um, that uh, we we are different uh, compared to the uh, organization, the loyal position to uh, imperialism you see around the world. Uh, some of them, are, you know, call themselves Marxists and all things like that, from France to England to Germany to Belgium. I checked, uh, the, you know, uh, the uh, the positions. It's incredible, just the solidarity, the unity with their own uh, bourgeoisie. It's incredible. I kept saying, uh, the uh, the workers from Ukraine and workers from Russia have nothing to gain uh, from it. The reality is, this is a colonial war, and we can see everywhere in Europe. I mean the unity with the war uh, for for you know for for those of us who are alive and particularly the younger generation who never experienced the opportunism while left you know uh, they can see it the opportunism of the white population is unbelievable uh, people like pop star or star celebrities like Beckham he has given his uh, Instagram account to a doctor from uh, Ukraine and he has 75 million followers that's unity of colonialism right there and he's not the only one uh, every day you read the news 
this celebrity, you know, this sports celebrity, this musician is lining up. So the uh, the role basically also of celebrities in the black community has to be definitely brought into question. You know, what side are you on? Because the colonizer celebrities are clear, they are for colonialism, gloves off. So we too have to begin, you know, we have to demand uh, if your personality, if your celebrity, you can't just say you're black. It's not enough. You have to be against colonialism, which means you have to take the position most of black people, most of black workers around the world are taking. They're saying, we are with Russia. You know, uh, that's really an a important point. There is another element with uh, the war, uh, the colonial war against Russia. And that was true during the Russian Revolution. And that's true today, because with the Russian Revolution, what the Bolshevik did, they deprived Europe access to vast resources, oil, diamond, you name it. And not only now, Russia is developed, Russia is industrialized, Russia is selling resources to them. Uh, the dependency on resources coming from Russia exposed also the colonial nature of the uh, Western world, because what they're doing, they are seizing Russian asset. Uh, and also, they kept saying we need, they need an alternative uh, oil supply and things like that, which basically, in another way, they're saying basically they need to attack Russia to get the oil to be in charge of the resources of Russia. They're not putting it like that, but the question we always ask, we. You know, uh, the chairman asked, towards what end? They're taking Russia towards what end? One thing we know, Russia has got resources, vast resources, just like Africa, vast resources. So the question of resources that the colonizers don't have uh, is really, uh, really uh, critical. And the last thing I want to say is that the propaganda, the lies, the lies every single day. The uh, colonizers are coming with lies about everything to do with Russia. They will say things like they're losing the war. They'll say things like uh, generals of Russian army, uh, they're dead. I read, I read one newspaper say the 15th commanders died. I mean, just, of course, it's a but most of it are lies and lies and lies and uh it just brings in into question uh the necessity for us uh for people who are listening uh that we are the one who have to bring the truth to the people which means the work we do how we move is significant because we are the one who are denying uh the colonizers total domination or total censorship that the truth doesn't come out. You don't know what's going on. Uh, the only thing you hear is what the bourgeoisie wants you to hear. And the bourgeoisie can only tell you lies and lies and lies all day, 24 hours. Lies, 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 lies. And this is going to deform reality if you're not uh, informed, if you have no connection to the African internationalism and the African People's Socialist Party. So the necessity for us to spread out, to get the news out, to do whatever we have to do to get everybody connected with this party with this movement is just critical we can't just over emphasize that so i use the opportunity to appreciate those who are making the wolf ideas right there by spreading this program uh we exceed 500 but it's not enough we have to exceed 1000 so hopefully we're going to beat that thousand before the end of the program uh -huh. well comment director i also want to uh add to what uh comment secretary terry general Luiz just said i mean yeah, there, there's, there's oil and other kinds of resources in Russia. Uh, but the other thing uh, is that uh, the U.S. and the, uh, the Western colonial powers are also having to contend uh, with the emergence of China. And China is challenging the hegemony of the United States. And it gives greater significance to, to Russia by them. If you got both Russia and China. Uh, that uh, often this contention, and they are both engaged in uh, with a conscious and purposeful drive to uh, to eliminate uh, the United States as this uh, unipolar power, that this hegemon uh, that that controls the world economy, 
the fact is that the, the, the reason the United States uh, uh, can shut down Russia's economy or nearly shut it down or affect it so severely is because it controls um, much of the banking uh, uh, world. It has uh, through uh, the, the same uh, 1949, uh, that same time frame where they created the United Nations and they created uh, the, uh, the NATO organization, they created various kinds of trade organizations. The United States became uh, the center of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, the world economy is uh, centered in the United States. They moved from what used to be in England the IMF and, and uh, the, uh, 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 the World Bank were created at this time. And so much of the world's resources, even Afghanistan, the Afghans beat them. The Afghans pushed the United States, crushed them, uh, humiliated them uh, in Afghanistan. Over 20 years, they could not win. So they, they were pushed out. And so what did they say? They're, let's starve them. Let's keep their money. Let's keep any resources from being able to go to them. Uh, and more and more countries are coming to a conclusion that they're going to have to find a way uh, to uh, deal uh, economically, financially in the world uh, uh, without the United States or neutralize the United States, that kind of power. <clears throat> and then China uh, has been driving, creating uh, it's this massive kind of uh, economic uh, drive, economic uh, development contending economic presence and political presence in the world. So this too contributes to the significance of Russia and why they're attacking Russia right now. And they have also China in the crosshairs and they are looking at and talking at China and they're trying to find a way, can we attack Russia and can we get China to unite with us against Russia uh, if we make these kinds of uh, 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 deals uh, with China? This is something that they're doing, 1972, uh, that was the objective of Nixon going to uh, China <clears throat> to uh, meet with Mao Zedong to try to um, minimize and undermine uh, uh, Russia <clears throat> as, a, as, a, as a part of its fight against Russia. Afghans, the, the U.S. initiated this war in Afghanistan. Uh, that was an ally of Russia at the time in order to uh, create another U.S. base there closer to and then uh, participating in the encirclement of, uh, of, uh, of Russia and also creating for it a, a Vietnam that would have it use all kinds of resources, et cetera, that would exhaust it uh, uh, politically, uh, uh, mor um, exhaust the mor morale of the Russian people uh, and economically. So this is part of what it is that we're looking at. It's not, it's, 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 yeah, they want to deal with all the resources there. They wanna make sure that Russia cannot compete with them, cannot contend with them cannot uh, uh, to, to destroy the reliance of Europe on Russian uh, petroleum, Russian uh, gas and things like that. That's part of it. But they're also doing this in the context of a real uh, desperate uh, uh, existential crisis uh, that uh, the white colonial powers are uh, experiencing at this very moment in history when also peoples around the world from Afghanistan to Syria to uh, Iran, uh, uh, to uh, uh, <clears throat> North St. Louis are fighting uh, to, to take back uh, our resources and our freedom. So that's part of the context that we're looking at. It's a desperate US. I mean, Biden uh, goes to uh, Poland and he's talking about what a despotic uh, guy Putin is and making all kinds of uh, extraordinary statements about how Putin shouldn't be uh, in power. Somebody should locate uh, the, the uh, documents and conclusions that came from the uh, World Tribunal on Reparations for African People that we did uh, in 1982 uh, in Brooklyn, New York. And part of what we came for was uh, that the United States should be kicked out of the United Nations just based on the United Nations uh, uh, charter and what have you. Uh, I mean, they, Biden can, can make these extraordinary statements on stolen indigenous land, uh, an economy created by uh, stolen African people, uh, and, we're, and that is responsible for the thousands and thousands of people in the United States killing right now in Yemen, starving in Afghanistan, the resources that own, that's owned uh, by, by Iran that it won't release to the Iranian people. I mean, this is, an, you know, the fact that they occupy part of uh, Cuba now with this, with this torture base, this prison in Guantanamo, 
this is the reality that we're looking at. So, it, I mean, this whole notion that somehow uh, this is not a pro-Russian position, or we are the black left, and we can't uh, we can't end up uniting with Russia. It's an extraordinary uh, statement of loyal opposition. It's a extraordinary statement of loyal opposition that we have uh, uh, around uh, the, the 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 Mother's March, and that's why. Uh, the righteous uh, folk got to stand up, got to take a stand, got to get on the right side of this question. Uh, the African People's Social Party and the Huda Movement, we, going, uh, we, we are struggling for total liberation, total freedom. There's no wishy-washiness around this question for us. We want it all. And the African people have to have power over our lives and the oppressed peoples of the world uh, have to be able to come together and crush uh, this colonial mode of production so there can be a genuine peace in this, on this planet Earth and, and not a, a world that's informed by the interests of these greedy parasites who, who've sucked the blood of Africa for 600 years and for many other peoples around the world uh, for a, a very long time as well. Uhuru. Uhuru, Uhuru Chairman, and thank you, Secretary General Lawazi. Um, And I've just been taking notes here. I think that, um, you know, what I've been able to, you know, gather just from this whole discussion and colonialism as the mode of production that gave rise to capitalism is that we understand this question. We understand that if colonialism ends, capitalism will die as a natural consequence and that capitalism relies on the colonial subjugation and exploitation. Like as uh, Secretary General Lawazi's PowerPoint just showed that um, Europe, you know, it doesn't produce anything for itself. It doesn't have its own means of development. It requires the colonial exploitation, the subjugation and oppression of Africa, African people, and the, you know, the colonized oppressed peoples around the world. And if you remove that from the whole equation, you know, um, uh, this whole uh, economic system, you know, ceases to exist. And I think when we understand that too. We can correlate how the world struggles and particularly those struggles being made by African people and the colonizers of the world. You know, every time that happens, it erupts. You have this extreme catastrophic event for the economy and you bring those two things together. Um, yeah, you just, you can understand how the colonial question attacking that, you know, um, uh, it will resolve every issue for all colonized peoples throughout the world. So I just, really, really appreciate this ideological breakthrough being presented to the rest of the world. Because again, this gives our struggle a concrete to what end. Um, if you're not struggling against colonialism, you can't call yourself an anti-capitalist. You are in support of capitalism, of the existence of the system, if you cannot join in the anti-colonial struggle. It's, it's just that simple. Um, yeah, I think it's important also to say that the only reason we're talking about Russia is because Garvey didn't succeed. Mm -hmm. We're talking about movements that's going on in the same period of time that you know, that reaches a certain kind of crescendo at the same period of time. Uh, not just Garvey. I mentioned Garvey because Garvey led a movement that was that spanned the globe. But you know, we're talking about the struggles that was happening in Nicaragua uh, uh, and in various other, Cuba, various other places around the world at this same time. We're talking about the fact the United States Marines invaded uh, uh, Haiti. Uh, in 1915, around the same time frame. The reason we're talking about Russia is because Russia succeeded. Uh, the Russians succeeded in taking power, and Garvey did not uh, succeed. That our movement, and it's our time. It's our time to succeed. We are the Garveyites of the 21st century. We are African internationalists. We are based on engaged in this revolution to take the power. Anything less than that is just a waste of time and spinning wheels and, and running on a treadmill. It doesn't matter how fast you run, you never get any place. And that's what we see with most of what, everything that calls itself black left and, and, and all of these other, uh, you know, iterations of liberalism. Uhuru. Uhuru, thank you so much, Chairman. Um, and at this moment, I, I do wanna uh, recognize one question that we got from uh, last week. Uh, which was um, from Dust James on YouTube. And um, in this process, Chairman, you can you know, also speak to anything additional, but I this gives me the ability to make a certain announcement. So uh, Dust James had asked, uh, what can we do here in the US to help support Russia's defensive war against the colonial powers? And I um, wanted to announce a demonstration and press conference that's happening um, at the Facebook San Francisco office on March 28th. 
Um, so that's upcoming um, at 12 uh, p.m. Pacific time at 181 Fremont Street, San Francisco, California. Um, the African People's Socialist Party will be conducting a demonstration and press conference at this, at the, at this Facebook office um, in regards to the censorship of Russia and Africa. And as we've talked about, you know, the imperialist propaganda is li literally, you know, whiting out, you know, in terms of media, the ability for Russia to speak for itself and in turn um, is not allowing for also, um, you know, even the, the analysis that we've been putting forward about Russia, you know, really attempting to block any kind of analysis that would be in support of Russia that helps to explain the situation in Russia and would condemn um, you know, the imperialist, the global colonial powers of the world. So it's blocking um, every attempt. You have Mark Zuckerberg, who is at these, you know, meetings with, you know, these high government officials, you know, being a part of the decision making. And it, all of it is very intentional. Um, and so we, you know, we are going to be demonstrating against this. Again, that's March 28th. So that's tomorrow, um, Monday at 12 p.m. Pacific time. And that's in San Francisco, California. So everybody um, in that area, or if you're not in San Francisco, but you're able to get in your car and drive to this demonstration, I just really, really want to um, urge you to do that. And, and Trevor, I don't know if you wanted to speak any more to Dust James' question. Um, yeah, I think that even if there's a, 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 a Facebook office, regional, uh, local office, wherever you're located, go there. Even if it's just you by yourself with your poster, because um, uh, uh, with your placard, because this should help uh, uh, everybody to understand the relationship to Russia and the anti-colonial question. Uh, because uh, Facebook has put Russia in Facebook jail. And there's a concept called Facebook jail because of what Facebook does to black people. Because you can't say anything that white power doesn't want you to say. You can't even say white in a certain way, in a certain context. Uh, you have to learn fancy ways to write white so that the, 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 the algorithm don't, uh, doesn't recognize what it is that you are saying. So, I mean, uh, uh, and the fact is they don't want uh, the world to hear our voices. They don't want the world to hear any contending voice. They have created this silo uh, through, uh, uh, through which uh, the world must be interpreted. Uh, so what you should do is you should join those. You should join the African People's Socialist Party. You should join uh, the Uhuru movement. You should join with the programs that's a practically and they're on the ground because we are practical revolutionaries. We're not just people who talk about stuff and you can find evidence of what we believe in and the struggle that we're involved in all around the world. Uh, and that's true in, in South Africa, that's true in Nigeria, that's true in, 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 in Mali uh, that we just talked about, uh, you know, with Mansa Musa. Uh, it's true of uh, every place that, that the party is located. So join the Uhuru movement. And if we're not located where you are, then join and then help us to organize where you are. This is the way because Russia is, you know, we talk about the how we uh, affect the, the outcome of the Russian, uh, uh, the, the war being made against uh, Russia, this defensive war. We recognize, we recognize that it is one of the battles in the whole struggle against, uh, against colonial, the colonial mode of production. So, you know, join uh, with the Uhuru movement and because you know that's what we're fighting against. Uh, you know that we are uh, struggling for the power against this colonial mode of production and, and find that, that mobilization is happening tomorrow uh, uh, at Facebook. Let's go, to, go there. And uh, even if it's only a handful of us with our posters, uh, we'll begin to get the word out because we have to find other methods of being able to communicate with each other because they still hold our capacity right now uh, in, in their grasp. Uh, that has to be overturned too. That's what the part of this whole struggle is about. You don't have to be some kind of loyal opposition. You have to get on the right side of history, join uh, with the African People's Socialist Party and the Uhuru movement. So thank you so much, comrade Uhuru. Uhuru, thank you, Chairman. Um, so, uh, oh, Secretary General, did you have something? Um, yes, well, just, <clears throat> just very quickly. Uh, because I was talking about uh, the propaganda, basically. Uh, one thing uh, people need to be aware uh, about this uh, colonial war against, uh, against Russia. I was listening to uh, a French uh, economist, uh, and uh, he said, uh, first of all, uh, he compared France 
and uh, and Russia. And uh, he said, France cannot go to war for two months. France will collapse. And he said, Russia can go to war for two years. And he said, Russia has a surplus, a balance surplus, far superior to countries like France or Britain, you know, and the rest of them. And Russia didn't have debt. You know, uh, U.S. economy and uh, 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 England economy and France economy, they are heavily in debt. And that was not the case uh, for Russia. And also, he said, most of the companies that are, are affected in Russia are foreign oriented companies. And Putin has also replied to those companies, if you leave, we're going to nationalize your companies. That's why, like France, uh, this company, Renault, Renault is a car maker, it's one of the biggest car makers in the world. They, they publicly said they're not leaving, they're staying in Russia. And uh, so this basically, you will not see this as a main news. The mainstream media, the you know, the colonial media will not say that, that Renault is not leaving. Uh, for example, the Germans, they paying using SWIFT system for the oil and Russia is getting like $800 million, uh, I think, I think it's a day, just selling oil to Germany and other Europeans who depend on its oil going through the SWIFT system, despite the sanctions imposed on them by Biden and the rest of colonizers, uh, uh, rulers. Of course, the media will not uh, go into that. And also, the other point is uh, the economist made, I think his name is Gaff, uh, the name of uh, economist. He made another point, he said, uh, uh, Russia's economy is like, um, he used the word, say, Otasi. I'm not sure if that's the correct word in English. Otasi. Basically, it's basically, you're producing for your own market, mostly. You know, producing because you're going to make money uh, around the world. So the sanctions will not affect those companies the same way. And he said, since the sanction really became heavy in 2014, after uh, Russia decided to take back uh, 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 Crimea. Crimea, the Russians have started to rely on themselves. Everything they used to buy, like the, the cheese from France, they're making it and things like that. So the sanction will not, I'm not saying the sanction will not hurt them, but it will not hurt them if, in a way the propaganda wants you to believe that Russia is collapsing, Russia is in its knees and things like that. So Africans have to be aware of that too. Wow. Uh -huh. Thank you so much, Secretary General and Chairman. I mean, this has just been such an incredible discussion and um, we want to be able to uh, definitely take questions from the audience if we have some time. Um, but again, just really want to salute uh, this whole discussion on colonialism as the mode of production. This is just uh, episode one, and we're understanding the significance and centrality of the colonial question. So um, we're going to take a moment of pause, uh, give our uh, panelists a little bit of a break, and go into some brief announcements. Um, if you do have questions pertaining to the topic, go ahead and drop those into the comment section. We're going to try to get to um, at least uh, one or two of those today. Um, so go ahead and drop those into the chat. But right now, let's get into our announcements. We have following today's study, the African National Women's Organization, ANWO, will host the final day of its annual national convention. The Black Women's Convention is an annual gathering of working class Black women who believe that colonial capitalism must be destroyed in order for African women to be free. So you can still register for today's program, which begins at 11 a.m. Eastern. So today at 11 a.m. Eastern, go to convention.anwouhuru.org and visit the African National Women's um, Organization Facebook page as well um, to stream. So uh, again, that's 11 a.m. Eastern. Today, following this study, we'll be um, uh, at the, the, the Black Women's Convention hosted by the African National Women's Organization. Next. <clears throat> Go ahead and, oh, um, there, there we go. All right, so go ahead and mark your calendars for African Liberation Day 2022, taking place May 28th and 29th and featuring parades and conferences in cities across the world. This year's African Liberation Day events will recognize the founding of the African People's Socialist Party in 1972 under the theme, Relentless, 
50 years of leadership toward African redemption. To connect with your region's ALD mobilization, visit ALD org. This is something you do not want to miss. Wherever you're located, there's going to be a regional ALD mobilization. So visit org to learn more about your region's um, African Liberation Day. Next. <clears throat> And of course, subscribe to the Burning Spur TV on YouTube and donate to your favorite show, Omali Taught Me, at paypal.me slash Omali Taught Me. Again, we are, you know, struggling against this censorship, this whiteout um, by colonial powers to um, uh, uh, prevent African people from being able to speak for ourselves. So we really call on you to combat this by supporting our platform. So um, subscribe to our channel and again, donate to paypal.me slash Omali taught me next. <clears throat> and for all your movement events and announcements, visit theburningspur.com slash events. So there's so much more that's upcoming and you can visit the burningspur.com slash events page to learn more about all of those different events. Uh, Chairman mentioned the Black Mothers March on the White House that's happening um, and several other things. So you guys can keep up with everything the party and the Uru movement is doing in a city a location near you at our events page. So um, that'll include the visual announcements. And I just want to join the call that was made by the chairman and Secretary General Mwazi Kinshasa, calling on you to join the African Revolution, the struggle against colonialism to overthrow, as uh, Secretary General said, the verdict of imperialism, destroy the colonial capitalist system, destroy the colonial mode of production, and seize the ability to develop our own lives with the utilization of our own resources, our own Africa for the, the development of African people. Join the African People's Socialist Party. To do that, visit APSPohuru.org. Again, that's APSPohuru.org. Go ahead and join. put in your application. The time is now to join the African Revolution. This is the moment that we have to make our position clear. We have to join the right side of history, and we have to struggle. No one's going to do it for us. We have to do it ourselves. We have to assume responsibility for our own freedom, our own liberation, and you can do that today, right now, at APSPUhuru.org. So that will wrap up our announcements um, uh, for today. And um, again, on the panel with us, we have Chairman Amalia Shatella and ASI Secretary General Louise Kinshasa, and we're discussing colonialism, the origin of capitalism. So before we take a look at um, questions that have come in from today, I want to acknowledge where people are watching from. We have Occupied Azania or South Africa, St. Louis, Missouri, Battle Creek, Michigan, Largo, Florida, Chicago, Illinois, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Fargo, North Dakota, Lakeland, Florida, Minneapolis, Minnesota, St. Kitts and Nevis, San Diego, California, New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, Richmond, Virginia, Marion County, Georgia, Oakland, California, St. Petersburg, Florida, Greenville, South Carolina, Portland, Oregon, Gainesville, Florida, West Michigan, Richmond, California, Fort Myers, Florida, London, Hempstead, New York, Granada, West Indies, Hawaii, Jamaica, Montreal, Canada, Toronto, Canada, Norfolk, Virginia, and Huntsville, Alabama with us today. So, Haru comrades, thank you for tuning in everywhere you are located. <clears throat> So um, comrade, uh, uh, comrade Diop on Facebook had asked this question early on in the discussion and let me just get to it. So um, he had asked, uh, and it did, wasn't, oh yeah, he asked it for the chairman, but both of you guys can, um, both of you can speak to this question. Um, Ahur chairman, thank you for this groundbreaking analysis and theoretical understanding of the world. What is the difference between value and wealth? I heard you. I was just okay. mulling over the question. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Comrade Diop, for the question. Uh, the difference in value and wealth. Um, I think uh, value uh, is. Uh, Louis, you want to take a jump, a stab yeah. at that? The difference well, in value and wealth? Well, um, basically, <clears throat> you, people can have wealth, but we can say we've got land that's wealthy. We've got gold, we've got, you know, uh, forests, uh, you know, as a national wealth, we can say that. We're going to have, uh, basically, we can own things that we can consider as wealth. But value, I think, presupposes that uh, there is a label involved in that, in transforming, um, uh, you know, nature or, or something like that. Because 
in the context we're looking at when we say uh, Europe has wealth, which we're talking of value stolen uh, from all the colonies uh, of the world. When in reality, why people when, when they just talk about wealth, the wealth they have acquired through uh, you know their careers or families, and this does no uh, make any connection with the value stolen from around the world. So I would definitely uh, uh, say uh, what, uh, value, uh, wealth you know, is whatever people have, but we have to basically include in that the part played by labor, particularly colonial labor. And this way we can, you know, lay out clearly our demand for reparation. We know why people go wealth. Everybody knows that. But we're talking of value stolen from us. And in that value, uh, we, we know the label that we put into that. And also the resources stolen from us, just like the United States built on a stolen land, on the wealth of the, on the land of the indigenous people. So land they on is wealth stolen from uh, indigenous people. But we're talking also of value stolen from African people, which make part of the wealth they have. So we can lay the basis for reparation claim on the value stolen from us, but also on the wealth stolen from us. You know, our trees, you know, our gold is ours, but also the value of labor that have gone into that. So we should always make it clear uh, this wealth but value that went to the wealth. You know, uh, that's, uh, yeah, what I can uh, say. I just think we can say that, that, I think you come in, Luis, I think that's very good. I think we can say that wealth is, uh, is an accumulation of value. And, uh, you know, which, uh, yes, I think that's, you know, a definition that wealth is an accumulation of value. Uh, which would be, you know, from labor, which would be from, you know, other kinds of resources. That's what wealth is. It's an accumulation of value. Yeah. And uh, I see that uh, someone, uh, comrade uh, Jamal, uh, what was he saying about, uh, he said something to, about, to this question about what wealth is. Uh, yes. What did yes. Jamal say? He said there are different types um, of, uh, I guess, different types of values as labor value, use value, commodity value. Um, <clears throat> so that's what. Yeah, but a wealth is an accumulation of value. It would mm -hmm. seem to me that would be inappropriate. Yeah. Thank you, Comrade Diop. Uh, I count on you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Her, her. Thank her. you, yeah. Um, I want to take this question because I, I think it's really important um, to just understand what's happening um, in terms of the increasing consciousness that African people are coming into. Um, and this, com this question came from Comrade Afua from the UK. Um, what are your thoughts on the visit of William and his wife to the Caribbean countries, Jamaica and the Bahamas? Not sure if you spoke on this. I joined late. Apologies. So um, if you, um, if Chairman yes. or General. Comrade Luiza, that's Comrade oh, Luiza. No. <laughs> I apologize. No, he did, no. No, no, they're his neighbors. So go ahead, Luiza. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. That's one person to call to join the African Liberation Community. <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, this question of uh, apology. We are the poorest in this country, in the UK, black community. We are the poorest. And the Caribbean, we are poor also. And here, comes the leader of people who have all our wealth and uh, he does not give back any of our wealth and they say they are sorry. You know, sorry does not do anything to us. It does not change the quality of our life. We're talking of qualitative transformation of our lives. So we want access to everything we produce. That's for sure. That's that's the starting point. Anything else is a bit of, uh, of a waste of our time. But I'm, I'm really uh, pleased to see that Africans are mobilized throughout the Caribbean and uh, the, they welcome uh, the leader of uh, the British society with demonstrations. You know, some say we don't want you in our land because they seem to own land in places like uh, Belize and the people, you know, uh, you know, they don't want that. They want to have access, to, you know, uh, of their own land. But the question of reparation as the, uh, the tribunal organized by uh, our chairman in 1982, I uh, say that uh, 
one of the objective was to make reparation demand uh, a household name. And we can see its success. We can see in the Caribbean, you know, from the uh, ruling class, they were forced, you know, to say they are down with uh, the reparation uh, demand. But uh, we need more than that. We need to have uh, a movement of uh, African people uh, everywhere in the Caribbean, in Europe, everywhere uh, uh, we are, that is demanding reparation as a part of the struggle to recapture our Africa, to recapture our life, to recapture our destiny, because the struggle for reparation is a struggle basically uh, of the working class to achieve power. And uh, we, you know, under the leadership of chairman and African Peace Society Party, we have already um, been moving forward by opening a front in the white community that they have to unite with reparation demand. Because when you see the struggle in the Caribbean, uh, we, they're demanding uh, the Prince of uh, England to, you know, uh, to say sorry uh, and for reparation. But it's like the white people who are watching for that from England, uh, they are not being challenged. They're just watching like from distance. But this demand is a demand for every single white person in Britain that you have to respond to the reparation demand. And uh, organizations who have made careers on reparations have not been challenging the white people uh, to unite with the demand of reparation uh, coming from uh, 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 black people. And this makes the African people, such as the African internationalism, so significant. Because we're saying reparation has to be paid. It's an ongoing process. We're not putting a date. You know, like the preacher say, Jesus will come back one day. They don't know when. So we're not saying that. We're saying white people have to be organized now so they can begin to pay reparation to legitimate leaders of African people. And African People's Social Party is a legitimate leader of African people. So we want reparation to be paid today everywhere black uh, white people are, particularly in Britain. And uh, we are, if white people are listening from Britain, there's an opportunity for them also to join this movement so the reparation demand coming from the Caribbean is really manifested concretely with real reparation coming to the struggle for self-determination of black power for black people. You know, so we unite with the struggle, the demand they're making. Only thing I'm saying, we need to develop it, take it to a high, another level as uh, the party has been doing for a while. Or, Uhuru, I just want to, I think that's right. But I also want to emphasize what we've said all along, that uh, reparation is a function of revolution and that we... Uh, have to deepen this question because it should be impossible for Biden to be in Poland uh, talking about Putin shouldn't be in power uh, because it's something that uh, they've initiated uh, in Ukraine, that is the United States, on the one hand, while he's not, uh, uh, he's not in, in, in London uh, saying that, uh, that uh, the Queen uh, and, and Boris shouldn't be in power because of what, what is happening, what they're doing in African people. When you see these people stand up like that, that should equate in your brain, if you understand the colonial mode of production and our significance, our centrality to the question, we can't take reparations, you know, like out of the context of this contest that we're involved in, the same forces the Russians are fighting right now. We're fighting them. How the hell we let Biden or anybody go, you know, like to Poland and talk about Putin shouldn't be there because they have initiated this war. And yet the same criminals who are initiating the war right now <clears throat> uh, 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 against Russia, uh, 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 holding African people in captivity, literally speaking, you know, uh, even if it's indirect to neo-colonial uh, means and, and have it stolen on all our resources. And we can't allow them to get away with that kind of discussion. When we come to understand our own significance, uh, Biden would be too timid to say that, uh, to go any place around the world, because we'd be tearing it up and Zuckerberg wouldn't be able to contain uh, the kind of outrage that African people would be displaying. Uhuru. Uhuru, Chairman. As we wrap up, I wanna just read a couple of questions. I mean, not questions, but comments that have come in over the course, uh, specific to the point that you just made. Uh, Comrade Janelle in Jamaica uh, said, Biden is the head of an entire global empire funded, founded on slavery, genocide, and colonialism, yet Putin is the one who shouldn't be in power. Um, so uh, thank you, Comrade Janelle. And then we had um, some really great comments, one from Comrade Mwazi in San Diego, California, said African internationalism 
gave me a love for learning again. I am so appreciative of the theory and our leaders. Learning, retaining information in history is difficult when it's a lie. Had me thinking I was a problem because I couldn't remember random dates and events that had nothing to do with me, us, but it's clear they had everything to do with us, which is why we are fed the lies. As chairman says, white people have been the subjects of history and African colonized peoples, the objects. African internationalism is rewriting our history. The party is rewriting our history and future. We are winning. Uhuru, Comrade Mwazi, and uh, Comrade King L, just regards to the censorship, said, I want to salute that outstanding presentation by Secretary General and the profound analysis by our chairman. In regards to the issue of Facebook, it should also be noted that not only is Facebook censoring and silencing voices, they are actually facilitating and amplifying so-called hate speech as long as it is directed against Russia and Russians. Anyone with two senses in their head can see the hypocrisy in this because Facebook's so-called anti-hate speech stance would block it against Russia slash Russians too, but only serves to further expose the fallacy of anti-hate speech. Burn down Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and the rest of the colonial modes of mind control. So Uhuru, um, comrades, thank you for your comments and for those questions that we weren't able to get to. Thank you. Do you see your... comrade uh, uh, Demetria oh. Hester, uh, her comments? <laughs> oh, no, I just, I'm just seeing this now. Yes, Uhuru, salute. We are protesting Facebook tomorrow. <laughs> Uhuru <laughs> said, burn it down. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you comrades for all of your engagement and um with the, just a couple of moments here sg i want to give you the ability to make any closing remarks and then chairman we're going to pass it to you to uh, close out this discussion so who sg oh you muted uh -huh. yes we will director okay the three things are for me uh the first one join 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 that's really key. Uh, the second thing, share, share, spread African internationalism widely, spread, spread it widely. And the third thing, if you are in Europe, uh, we want you to join the African Liberation Day Committee uh, as we 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 begin to to organize for the 29th of May African Liberation Day in Europe. We're gonna have two in you in Paris and in London. So if you're in Europe, please get in touch with us. So we can, uh, you can play a role in uh, winning the war of years by organizing African people so we can win our freedom. Or... Uhuru, uh, thank you, Comrade Secretary General Luizzi, uh, <clears throat> Comrade uh, Director Akile Anai. Uh, it's been an extraordinary discussion. I really want to appreciate uh, the presentation provided to us by Carmen Luizzi. Uh, he's done an incredible amount of research. He's been doing this for many, many years and collecting uh, all of the history, all of the evidence that uh, confirms, uh, that validates our position around colonialism, not just being some policy uh, or simply a policy by a particular power, but a mode of production. And we've seen this mode of production being uh, the force that's driving some of the most reactionary uh, 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 forces in the world. When you look at, uh, you know, what uh, the, the, the how the even latecomers like the, the illegitimate uh, white nationalist state of Israel, colonial mode of production. The, the thing is that white power has understood for a long time, if you want to get over, if you want to get rich, if you want to make a lot of resource short period of time, then uh, steal somebody's land, steal the resources, steal the people themselves if you can. That's what America is, a settler state. That was one of the things Europe learned a long time ago. <clears throat> and the Israelis, the so-called Israelis, uh, is a settler state, uh, just like uh, South Africa, a settler state, just like Zimbabwe, a settler state, just like Namibia, a settler state. And <clears throat> so we've seen this process of uh, these they are get rich schemes and based on the colonial mode of production and uh, African people ourselves, uh, the victims of this have to come to understand our own historical significance and we have to unite together, build the African People's Socialist Party globally, build the African Socialist International globally and become part of a trajectory uh, that is designated, that is designed uh, to destroy colonial mode of production and bring not only freedom for our people, but uh, change this uh, situation where we've got some countries and peoples who rule and lord it over other countries and people who humiliate Africa and African people uh, in this kind of uh, world that we have with, with bosses and workers and slaves and slave masters and create a new world. That's our objective. That's what the African People's Socialist Party is about. 
So uh, we have 50 years of history of making this struggle. We're not newcomers. And we say that all of us have a responsibility uh, to fight for and win uh, the redemption of Africa and African people globally. Uhuru, thank you so much. Uhuru, Chairman, thank you so much. Thank you, Secretary General of the Wades of Kinshasa and all of you comrades who have been participating with us up to now. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and move to close. As I mentioned, um, the African National Women's Organization's final day of its convention is happening uh, beginning at 11 a.m. Eastern today. So make sure you uh, go travel over to the annual Facebook page or go to convention.annualhuru.org to register. I also um, need to make this announcement and we'll get this up on um, a visual for next week, but the sixth electoral campaign school hosted by the Black is Back Coalition um, is happening April 9th, um, to 9th through 10th, 2022. Um, it'll be held in person in St. Louis, Missouri at 4101 West Florissant at the Uhuru House or on Zoom. To register, go to blackisbackcoalition.org. The theme is Beyond the Colonizer's Coup to African Self-Determination. So again, this is our sixth electoral campaign school. Go to blackisbackcoalition.org to register. Thank you, comrades. Uh, make sure to like and subscribe to the Burning Spur TV on YouTube to catch every episode of the Omali Taught Me Sunday Study. Join the African Revolution. Vanguard up. Uhuru.